So we're just going to kick off our session on shark depredation and mitigation. Um, feel free to come forwards to the front if you want to be able to see and hear better. I thought we'd have more people, but that's all good. Uh, so we've got four speakers in this session today, uh, and then we'll have a bit of a QA and a at the end, similar to the other sessions. And then, so first up, there's been a bit of a change to the first talk. Grace Castleberry is unable to make it due to illness, uh, but her supervisor, Andy Danilchuk, is stepping up to present this one. And this is going to be on the research Grace has been doing for her PhD on depredation in the United States. Thanks, John. Thanks very much for being here. I'm being blinded a little bit. That's all right. Um, I just want to really acknowledge that um, this is Grace's work. Um, and even though I'm her advisor, um, she deserves the credit for not only this talk, but a talk that um, Dr. Luke Griffin's um, giving uh, last in this session. Um, you know, unfortunately, she couldn't be here because of COVID, but um, you know, we're definitely going to try to do the best we can. Um, and you know, to lead off this session, um, really uh, thinking about the emerging needs um, to address shark depredation and shark angler conflict in recreational fisheries. It's a quickly emerging discipline or need, conservation concern, uh, one that I've been observed personally and uh, a lot that we're doing in our lab. But I'm going to present on behalf of Grace and her other co-advisor, Dr. Greg Skomal, um, some lessons learned from the U.S. recreational um, fishery. And I have notes because I don't want to screw up Grace's talk. So, um, so this image is actually from uh, the first shark tournament in Florida um, that was specifically pitched at addressing depredation uh, by harvesting sharks to reduce numbers. It was held uh, in July of 2022 uh, in Jupiter, Florida, um, and it was entirely legal um, and uh, samples were donated to science. Uh, but if you followed the social media and you followed the news about it, uh, the motivation was to basically try to get rid of sharks because sharks are getting in the way of angling opportunities. Um, and um, this was their motivation. Um, and this is coming up a lot on social media. Social media is that double-edged sword where we're um, People are sharing more about their successes uh, when they go recreational angling, um, but also some of these where it can be exciting, there could be the shock and awe part of it, uh, but um, we're seeing more and more uh, images um, that are really um, maybe adding to the fuel and the motivation and the anger against sharks uh, as um, they are taking critters, uh, the, the catch off the line. Um, and so just to lead things off, if you're not familiar about what depredation is, <laughs> what is depredation? Uh, it is, at a, a 40,000-foot view, it is a human-wildlife conflict. Um, and it is the uh, full or partial removal of fish from fishing gear before landing. Um, and there can be a, a variety of uh, animals that can do the depredating from uh, marine mammals, seabirds, teleos, and sharks. Um, and actually, uh, speaking with a lot of, and this is all in marine systems, but we're actually um, starting to hear some incidences of depredation in freshwater fisheries um, as things in the US, as bald eagles and other uh, piscivorous birds are uh, rebounding. Uh, there are uh, stories of eagles following drift boats down rivers as people are catching their trout and the, tr the beagles are going down and grabbing the fish off the end of the line. Um, so it's depredation is, uh, is a thing not only in marine systems but in freshwater systems. And obviously some of these, many of these are wonderfully charismatic megafauna uh, that um, are doing the depredating. And um, what this leads to, and it really is asking the question, is this a perfect storm for shark angler conflict? Uh, we'll, we're, we'll focus, we'll narrow it down on, on sharks, um, where it seems to be the majority of, the, where the majority of the depredation is occurring between sharks and fish. Um, and Carlson et al. in 2019 
really ask the question, are we ready for shark conservation success? You know, as we are putting a lot of emphasis on helping to recover shark populations, are we ready for what that looks like in terms of um, more sharks in the water and the potential for more exposure to humans, uh, whether they're depredating fish off the end of their line uh, or whether we're, well, I'm up in New England, all of a sudden there's more white sharks in the water around Cape Cod and uh, people are freaking out because they like to go surfing or swimming and there's that sort of stress and conflict as well. Um, the, we also, um, as we've heard um, across uh, the last couple of days of this conference, uh, we're seeing increasing uh, participation rates in recreational angling. Uh, recreational angling was the sport of the pandemic. Uh, there's greater angling pressure. There's more lines in the water. There's more sharks in the water. We have social media. Um, so is this a perfect storm uh, where we're increasing that sort of um, the angler for, for depredation and that, that conflict between sharks and, um, and anglers. Um, the three figures below uh, from Peterson et al. in 2017 uh, were showing the recovery of some of the uh, shark populations uh, in the U.S. And it also demonstrates that there might be a little bit of a mismatch between the shark populations that are coming back versus the sharks that are actually doing the depredating. Uh, but because we don't have a lot of data on uh, the sharks that are doing the depredating, there's still um, some ambiguity, and I think that's also opening a door for a lot more research that needs to happen. So with this in mind, and um, with some uh, other work from Grace's PhD that Luke's going to present, uh, we wanted to get an understanding of uh, what are the perceptions uh, that anglers have when it comes to shark depredation. How are they responding? How are they feeling? What's driving their motivations and their angst and their anger? Um, and so um, Grace put together this uh, proposal, uh, excuse me, a survey, um, and um, it was published in 2022. So I'm gonna present some of the data very briefly and then talk about maybe some solutions moving forward. And I'm gonna try not to run out of time. Um, so to sum things up really quickly, with lots of pictures, uh, the species that were being uh, depredated uh, varied by region. Um, this was uh, a survey done throughout the United States, so we looked on both coasts. Um, and uh, so in some areas, uh, we've got you know, some yellowfin tuna, striped bass in the northeast, uh, red snapper in the Gulf of Mexico. Some of those populations are recovering. Some of the populations are threatened. Um, bonefish in the Florida Keys. Um, and uh, kingfish uh, um, in, along the Carolinas. Um, so it really varied by region and it varied by habitat, flats, reef, coastal, and pelagic. So it's happening everywhere. This figure, um, it, one of the questions in the survey asked if you've experienced depredation more than 20 times in the last five years. Um, and so this figure shows the sort of the regional distribution of those respondents that said, yes, I've experienced a depredation more than 20 times in the last five years. And you can see it where a lot was in Florida. Um, and I forget how the pointer works here. Hang on. No, it's not working. Never mind. Um, the Carolinas, the orange and the sort of red um, in the southeastern part of the United States, and a little bit up where I'm from in Massachusetts, the purple. Um, so there's some regional differences um, occurring, and so we can think about how that plays into ultimately management regulations and changing social norms tied into the shark angler conflict. In the, um, we, Grace was able to separate the respondents by, for, between anglers and fishing guides, thinking that maybe fishing guides because of uh, the livelihood that they are, get from being a guide. Uh, they might have a different set of opinions based and feelings based on depredation. Um, and so what this is showing, so anglers are on the, in the left column, guides are on the right, and then um, on the, for each bar, the red is much less likely and the blue is much more likely. Um, and the places that really stand out is uh, the third from the top in terms of harvesting sharks if you look over at the fishing guides, um, based on depredation, um, oh, there, I got the little thingy now. There we go. Uh, based on depredation, they're, they're, they're more likely to start harvesting sharks 
um, and also more likely to target sharks recreationally. Um, and this is based on their feelings, their perceptions, and their, their concern over how that's impacting their livelihoods. Um, and they also are showing that uh, they're um, much, much less likely to bring clients to the, to the same area. Um, and also, um, so they're, they're, it's going to force shifts in the way that they actually um, operate as a guide. And they're also going to be nasty, potentially, against sharks. Um, another thing that came out of the, um, the survey uh, was, um, so this is a, um, some models that looked at the perception of shark threats along the x-axis. axis. This is the likelihood of harvesting sharks. And this is um, looking at the, um, the negative emotions. One would be if you had weak negative emotions against uh, sharks. Five, you have strong negative emotions against um, the, your feelings about threats of sharks. And what I really want to point your attention to is the, the, the sort of bright blue line in that if you have really strong negative emotions against sharks, that your probability of wanting to harvest sharks goes up. So it's really that negative emotion, that negative feeling. It's not necessarily the awe and, oh my God, I just saw a shark. It's like, this shark is screwing up my livelihood, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to want to harvest it. Um, and so um, that's really summing that, uh, a lot of this um, the survey up um, that, that Grace did. In comparison, um, so there have been some uh, similar surveys done in Australia, so bring it in the context here. Um, some uh, uh, similar results from Queensland, Australia by Hoyle et al. in 2022 uh, really showed that um, they looked at the perceived increase in uh, shark abundance and perceived threat to personal identity um, and looked at different um, tiers of conflict and identified that like this perceived threat to personal values or identity was like, really at the root of um, some of the angst against sharks and the thoughts related to shark depredation. Um, and then, if I do this properly, animation, oh boy, oh boy, there we go. Um, and then there was another survey in Western Australia by Clusen et al. in 2022, and the respondents there showed that, um, that their anglers were, and guides were most likely to, uh, to move fishing spots. Um, so I'm sure you guys are hopefully going to talk a little bit about that, right? Great. Awesome. Thank you. Um, hopefully that teed you up very nicely. Um, so now we start, need to start thinking about solutions, right? And so it's, it's, it's an emerging concern. Um, and the first solution um, that we wanted to put forth is this idea of time area closures. Um, this is some experience that we've had in the Florida Keys working at a uh, in conjunction with Bonefish and Tarpon Trust and thinking about uh, movement patterns of permit and to aggregation sites and uh, the closing of a place called Western Dry Rocks uh, where some science that have done through the, um, uh, my lab and also at Carleton University with a, a PhD student, Pete Holder, showed that there is 90% depredation rates for, for permit at these aggregation sites because the permit were aggregating and so were the sharks. Um, and so this was an example of, of uh, a, a time area closure, but it, it took a while, yep, and uh, it was very time consuming and kind of contentious. Um, then there's the, uh, the, the next thing would be the idea for behavioral change, um, and uh, Luke's gonna talk a little bit about that um, in the talk, the, the talk coming up. Um, but thinking about working with guides and anglers are thinking about adequate tackle for target species, not playing a fish for so long that it's stressed out, that it's being attracted by, that it's attracting a, a predator, um, changing locations and fishing spots, breaking the line if uh, fish behavior indicates that the shark is present, um, and potentially in the, tar in the tarpon fishery, changing target depths. And that might influence the, the or reduce the shark angler uh, interactions and depredation. And then the last um, thing to, to ponder, um, there's a lot of technology that's available now, rare earth magnets that have been used for, to look at uh, changes in depredation in um, commercial fishing, um, thinking about electro, messing around with electromagnetic fields for sharks because of their ampullae of Lorenzini, um, and chemical deterrence. 
it's, it's an emerging field. It, we, we really need a lot more about this uh, done, um, and, but it's also going to vary potentially by target species, by location, by water chemistry, by flow. Um, we're, we're, just, we're just at the tip of this emerging um, concern um, and also uh, the science behind it and, and trying to find a way to mitigate things like this. Um, or even questioning, is this a concern, right? Are we removing, you know, if, are we gonna be removing too many sharks from a population to have any sort of major impact? But um, this is something that from a, a collaborative research and uh, management perspective that um, I think there's gonna be a lot needed in the future to kind of um, control or examine this um, animal wildlife conflict. So I'm gonna end there. Yeah, cool. And I apologize for Grace, to Grace for doing a poor job. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Andy, and thanks, Grace, for putting together the talk. And so next up, we have Gary Jackson, and Gary's a fisheries scientist working for the Western Australia Department of Primary Industries and Regional Development. And Gary's going to be talking about some shark deterrent testing he's been doing over there. Thanks, John. Should we just press? Oh, that's the, yeah. So that's just a visual size. Okay. And then you can use, if you use that. Yeah. yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Um, just before I get going, I'd like to um, acknowledge the, uh, the uh, Aboriginal uh, owners of the lands we're meeting on today, the Burrung Boon Warung people and the Warung Jerry Woi Warung people, and uh, honour their elders past, present and future. Um, that was a great talk from Grace. Uh, she had this set the scene really nicely. I usually have a problem with running over with my talks, so... I should be able to scoot, scoot through a lot of the introductory stuff. Um, so I've been working on this topic of depredation uh, in Australia. I'm based in Perth, Western Australia. I deal with commercial and recreational fisheries probably for more than 10 years now. And John, who's talking next, and I have been working on, in collaboration on this probably for seven or eight years when he was at studies PhD. And um, So, yeah, there's a lot of crossover. Look, it's, uh, it, it, it is a big issue. It uh, has been in Australia, around northern Australia, probably for... 10, 10 plus years, hard to put exact time around it. Look, there's economic costs, there's a lot of politics involved, a lot of media attention. Um, so I work in government, so when people are jumping up and down a meeting, say, do something about this problem, I say, well, you know, what is the problem? I've got to go to the minister to try and get him to do something. But there's some key information that's missing here to kind of get the policy action that actually uh, pissed off fishermen want. And that is primarily, what are the rates of depredation? Is it going up or is it... Where, where is it occurring? Is it, is it everywhere or is it particular locations? What species of shark are involved? That's kind of critical. And mitigation. Uh, is, is there any mitigation kind of possible out there? Um, it was the topic for a national workshop. Uh, the FIDC funded in the middle of last year, which was a really good workshop, pulled together scientists, policy makers and stakeholders. Some very interesting outcomes. Great document John put together prior to that. And it came up with some key outcomes. And one of the key ones of those are we need further development and testing of these mitigation devices, which is really what I'm going to be focusing on this talk. Um, in Western Australia, uh, this was a big issue for recreation and commercial sectors, and we got some money uh, from government and from uh, the Rec Fishing Peak Body uh, through, through their boat licence fees. Um, and we put together a project uh, which had three specific objectives. So a survey of recreational fishers to see if they were actually already using any mitigation approaches to kind of get, get around this issue, if you like. Uh, testing some deterrents, and I'll, I'll get to that, and then communicate the results of our work, which we did. So the pictures of the bottom is we took a roadshow right around the key, key ports in Western Australia to tell people what the results were. Not that they were particularly happy with the results, but nonetheless. So which devices? Um, so when we were putting this project together, probably 2018-19, we looked at what devices were really either available and at market or, or soon to be. Um, and it's a little bit different now. It's a very, very active uh, development space, I guess. Uh, but the client wanted us to test a number of devices. With, with hindsight, I would have rather had one device and be able to test this experimentally much better. But nonetheless, um, and I would make the point that these devices we, we were selecting at the time, there was only one of them, the Shark Bands product, which was actually designed to minimise depredation. The other products have really been adapted from protecting protecting people from uh, shark, shark attack or shark bite, if you like. But the, just the depredation issue is a, is a massive potential market across commercial and recreational sectors, and this is why the work that we've done here is, is quite important in my view. Look, most of the developers uh, are spruiking uh, their devices uh, as, as successful, but when you actually dig 
bit deeper and find out how they've been tested and evaluated, there's kind of not, not a lot there, which for me is a little bit of a problem. So why is it important? If agencies, governments are promoting mitigation and purchasing of devices by individual fishers as a, as a way out of this problem, if you like, um, there's got to be some sort of standard, you know, because some of these things potentially... So the, the, uh, the Ocean Guardian device... Um, I, well, I'll get to that in a minute. So they, they all, these three devices work on slightly different approaches. So we've got the electrical device, the Ocean Guardian, on the left-hand side, which creates a curtain around, around the vessel. Uh, we've got the shark bands, which works on a magnetic kind of basis, ma creates a magnetic field around the, the bait and where the, 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 potentially the fish is. And then shark stopper works on acoustics. So it's only shark bands was the only product which was designed with minimising degradation in a recreational setting specifically. The others have been adapted, really, from protecting people. Um, so uh, the field tests. So we set about designing experimental design to go and test these things basically ag against against no fishing. So the four treatments were, so we got pretty pictures here. We got the Ocean Guardian on the ro top right. The two shark band devices, the one we tested was the Sentry, which is never actually got to market. The Zeppelin is the one you can buy now, but operationally they, they really work quite the same, although Nathan Garrison will probably say differently. Uh, we got the Shark Stopper, which basically plays the noise of a, 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 um, an orca under the water and apparently scares, scares the sharks. Uh, so the sampling design was we had four, four treatments, if you include no, fish, no, no device in the water. Um, a fishing session at each location, um, so we could then move to an, another location and do approximately four or five locations in a day. Um, so you're getting away from sharks, right? So you don't want to be testing device time over time over with the same sharks in theory. Um, we had three people fishing, standardised rod and line gear. It's a randomised design, uh, which freaks a lot of people out, developers who just can't get their head around that idea. We did a power analysis beforehand, which is the kind of the key kind of take-home message here. So there's Australian standards when you're going to test something. You've got to have an 80% effect for a test to be worthy of anything, right? Which, if you dig deep and talk to a statistician, you can lose yourself in the woods. So the effect size is important. What sort of effect are you trying to look for? Because you're never going to get anything which is 100% effective. So what's acceptable? We're talking about a product here. So like a 10% effect's probably not useful if you're going to spend $100 or $1,000 on the unit. So we, we settled on a 50% effect size. So we'd go and test to show that whatever, your catch, half your catch was going to be protected by using a device or not. Um, and we put GoPros on all the fishing gear. We did a lot of fishing. Uh, we learned a lot of things. Phase one of the project, um, we started off with the Brawlers. We went to Shark Bay. But we really hit the hot spot when we went to Exmouth and then in Monte Bellows, which were areas where we'd had a lot of reports from fishers, uh, charter fishers, private fishers and commercial fishers about losing fish. I should say we were focused on reef fish, demersal fish we call them. Uh, we're not talking about pelagics, we're talking about fishing in relatively deep water, you know, cranking fish up from the bottom, sharks. Uh, we limited our work to about 50 metres. The GoPro devices at the time uh, wouldn't, wouldn't work uh, deeper than that, and that was a bit of a criticism of work. Anyway, look, we collected a lot of samples. Um, we went fishing sometimes and we caught fish, but we didn't have sharks. And that doesn't give you any useful information about testing devices, although some people kind of argue the point that you've still got samples. So. so it was a long slog to get sufficient samples to kind of test uh, the, the effect of this stuff. That was my point. We, we spent a lot of time on the water. These guys had a lot of fun fishing all day, every day, for days and days and days. I'll, I'll get this out of the way because everybody's interested in what species of shark. So in Western Australia, we've done a fair bit of work um, over the journey, uh, it's been published using a DNA barcoding approach where you take swabs from the shark, bark, the shark bites on the carcasses and then matching that against the DNA base. And you get, we've had 100% success rate matching up. And there's the same species of shark, you know, kind of pretty regularly turn up in this part of Australia, okay? And this project, testing devices with underwater cameras, which is a lot harder to, to particularly the carcarinas, to identify accurately the species level from, from images, at depth, you know, murky water, movement, all those kind of things. But there's a list of, of um, species we, are, we identified. Um, I would say there's a mixture of species in there. We have commercial fisheries in Western Australia, some of those species of commercial interest, and so there's a whole bunch of issues around kind of catching more of those, if you like, if that's your solution. We've got species we don't know much about, and we certainly don't know much about stock status. And then you've got uh, some protective species in there as well. So it's really problematic with a kind of single line of what are we going to do about this. Um, so we get the results. The table at the top 
just shows you that we had to do this experiment over a number of seasons. So when we did the modeling to get the results out of this, we had to put a season in as a factor. Um, and um, yeah, so we, we, um, I'm not going to talk about the stats or the modeling. Uh, come and talk to me afterwards. But the, basically, the results that people are interested in, the probability of the occurrence of depredation during a fishing exercise on both the graphics the control is the furthest left in each, each set, so the farthest left figure. These are mean values, not the raw data. Um, you've got the uncertainty around that. So in all cases, uh, the control is we've got no device in the water. That's like the background level of the probability of depredation, right? And then you drop down, which, which is a good thing, the probability of occurrence when you've got the devices in the water. There is a reduction there, OK? So it means you're going to have less occurrence of depredation with devices in water. Some difference between the devices. You need to be careful here. The other, the other figure, the coloured figure, actually separates out the, uh, the, the, the three different devices against the control. Now, I wouldn't read too much into how the, each device is compared against one another. I think the key message is these things, these things do actually work, but they're not a silver bullet. There's no device out there that's actually going to, you know, 100% you protect you against depredation. But it's a question of degree. Um, and I think there's, there's a lot of variation you're going to get. If we went and did this all this work again, you're going to get some slight changes in those things to do with season and uh, where you're fishing, those kind of stuff. Um, but the devices did decrease, increase the proportion of fish that was returned to the boat without the sharks taking them, which is the key lesson, I think, for recreational fishers. Um, and so the lessons learned from, from this are depredation is a complex issue. Basically running experiments in the wild with a large predator and all the other variables going on to end up with data that you can then apply you know, conventional stats to to get a result is very, very difficult. And don't let anybody kid you that it's a simple issue. There's a number of people trying to do this now around the world for PhDs and uh, we're here to help where we can. You need very clear objectives you can do these tests if you think about it. Just we're hopping into it and say we, we think these things are going to work. What's that actually mean? What's the level of effect that's acceptable? Because they're consumers we're giving advice to, right? And potentially commercial fishermen, charter boats, investing a lot of money in these gears. Um, talk to a statistician if you're not a statistician yourself and get the advice to design, design the work. Um, and look, my argument is there's, there's need for national guidelines in regard to this, and we're trying to work on that. And it certainly applies to the devices which are used to protect people from actually being eaten or losing limbs. There's no standards. People can say, rub chili oil on the surfboard and you'll never get taken by a shark. Now, that's actually potentially dangerous. If we were in another place, I think litigation's just around the corner in some cases. So we need national guidelines, possibly an Australian standard, if governments are going to be recommending to commercial fishers, recreational fishers, Use these things as part of a, as a, of a, of a mitigation strategy, if you like. I'd just like to acknowledge all the guys that uh, participated in this project as the developers. They've been really, really good, and we've kept them informed all along the journey. Um, and the, the guys that were out on the water and the, and the guys that took us out on their boats. So uh, thanks for listening. Anybody got any questions? <laughs> Talk to me afterwards. Yeah. Thanks, Gary. That was a great talk and, uh, yeah, saved us a few minutes at the end. So, yeah, next up. Just get this working. Yeah, so, so the work I'm going to be presenting is on a review paper that we've done recently. This involved quite a few different authors from around the world and essentially stemmed from a special session we had at the World Fisheries Congress in 2021. And... Based from that, there was a, a special issue in the reviews in Fish Biology and Fisheries Journal, which where we pitched the shark depredation review. So I'd just like to acknowledge all the traditional owners of the land on which this conference is held and all the other lands in Australia where our shark depredation research has been taking place. So you've already had quite a good intro to shark depredation. Obviously, it's a topical issue, it's complex, there's a lot of different impacts on target species, on the satisfaction of recreational fishers, and also on sharks as well. And as Andy touched on, it's also not just sharks doing this, but things like dolphins and large teleosts. So there's an image down the bottom there of a cod which is trying to depredate hookfish. So it's a whole range of different predators we're talking about. 
Why depredation matters to recreational fishers? Obviously, as we've just heard from the National Recreational Fishing Survey, we know that recreational fishing is a huge, hugely important contributor to the economy. People spend a lot of money on fishing gear, boats, trips to go fishing. So when you're getting shark depredation happening, this is all damaging that recreational fishing experience that we value. Also, in some areas, recreational fishers represent the main sector harvesting that resource. So obviously, if you're getting extra mortality occurring from depredation, that's also a big issue. Because typically, some fishers will continue to fish until they reach their bag limit. So any fish on top of that that they've lost to sharks along the way is an extra, extra source of mortality. Um, and as also Gary mentioned, this is a very sort of polarizing issue. There's a lot of frustration from fishers around lack of action on this, which has been building over a number of years now. So we did some work in 2018 um, to really get a sense of the global state of knowledge on depredation. And this essentially involved reviewing all the existing literature on the topic. And I just put up a figure at the bottom there, which shows the number of studies on depredation from anywhere in the world by decade. So you can see prior to the year 2000, there was really only like a handful of studies on this issue. And then there was a rapid increase after 2000. And this really reflected sort of a growing recognition of this as an issue. And on the right there is just an example of a report from the Indian Ocean Tuna Commission. They had a big workshop on depredation, looking at not just shark depredation, but also from cetaceans as well. And that was mainly centered around commercial longline fisheries. So to give it a bit of an Australian focus, um, there was also obviously a big lack of research in Australia on this issue prior to 2015. But since then, we've now, between different research groups, we've published about 14 papers on the issue across three different states. So we did a survey in 2016 to look at the, uh, to quantify depredation rate, and we found that approximately 12% of the catch was being taken, and that was across a recreational fishery in northwest Western Australia, the same region that Gary was just talking about. And that figure up in the top right there is a map of all the fishing trips that occurred in that survey. So there's about 400 fishing trips we collected data from using boat ramp surveys. And the color scale represents the depredation rate. So most of those were at the lower end of the scale between about 0 to 20% of the catch being lost. But you can see some trips dotted in amongst there where the depredation rate was over 50%. So on a trip basis, this can have a really big impact on fishers. And some further work we did, there's a paper at the bottom there, um, which was a collaboration looking at uh, shark depredation in the WA commercial Spanish mackerel fishery. And this was a nice case study because it's actually pretty much one of the very few fisheries in Australia where we have any long-term data on this issue um, as it's been recorded in logbooks. And that data was very interesting. It allowed us to tease out some of the more important factors that were influencing depredation and changes over time. We also had a national workshop on shark depredation last year, hosted by FRDC. So some of the key questions around depredation, what sort of an impact is it having overall? What shark species are responsible? And what's, what are actually the drivers? Is it being primarily driven by behavior or recovering shark populations? or changes in fishing dynamics or prey abundance. There's a whole range of different factors going on here. So given that there's been this sort of rapid increase in research over the last few years, we decided to do a new synthesis of the latest findings to try and identify where we need to go next. And this was how this review came about. And we wanted to make it broader to include a, the range of people that presented in that session at World Fisheries Congress and to give it more of a global perspective than just Australia. And the three main themes in this review were around characterizing depredation, managing depredation, and then mitigating it. So characterizing one key um, gap that we found in terms of our knowledge of depredation was understanding the social aspects. And this is obviously very important when we're talking about recreational fisheries, because it's not all, all just about economics. So, in particular, we know that obviously depredation has these clearly identifiable impacts, things like losing your catch, losing fishing gear. However, we don't really know as much about all the underlying things that are going on. So as we've touched on before, there's this sort of a bit of a distrust between fishers and fishery managers and um, 
Also, a lack of communication of the science. So, for example, on shark conservation um, narratives, there's obviously, you've got two different things going on. You've got sort of global scale of shark conservation, and then you've got the local scale. And what fishers might be seeing in their local environment in terms of shark populations might not be the same as what we know is happening globally. So there's sort of some issues around the messaging there. And then you've got conflicts between sectors as well. Often, obviously, you've got commercial fishing, charter, recreational and indigenous all happening in the same area. So there's some overlap and potentially some conflicts occurring there. And basically, um, there's a big gap in terms of our understanding of the social aspects, and there's a range of different ways we can address this. So you've got short surveys like the ones we did at boat ramps where you collect um, short answer questions, and this is mainly looking at sort of quantitative data. And then you've got longer, open-ended interviews where you actually sit down with the fisher for 30 minutes or an hour and actually explore some of these concepts in a much deeper way to get more of the background information and find out some of these underlying factors. Content analysis is actually really useful because it gives us more of a historical perspective. So you can look at how depredation might have changed over sort of periods of many decades. And then participatory modeling, which I'll show you an example of in the second, is a really nice tool to actually bring together all the different factors which might be influencing depredation. So to show you this, this is some work that Marcus Dryman and his team have been doing in the Gulf of Mexico and the US. So he's been conducting some workshops with charter fishers there to really explore the, um, the scale of the depredation issue and all the factors which might be influencing it. So on the right, we have an example of a, it's called a mental model that um, essentially they've created from one of these workshops with the charter fishers. So they bring up all the different factors which they think might be influencing it and then generate all these arrows to indicate not only the, the nature of the relationships, but the thickness of the arrows represents the strength as well. So obviously, if you've got a thicker hour, it means a stronger effect. And just from looking at that, you can see already that it's very complex. There's a lot of different things going on. You've got the abundance of things like groupers and red snapper. You've got the regulations governing whether they're protected or not, or how many fish you can harvest. You've got climate change in the mix. You've got fishing uh, behavior and preferences. You've got commercial fishing. So really, it helps to like, bring all this together and visualize it. And another nice thing about it is you can actually then run some scenarios. So if you were to introduce a new management measure, how would that then have a knock-on influence on all these different things and the depredation? Identifying shark species is another aspect where we've made quite good progress in the last few years. As Gary touched on, we've been using cameras and genetic methods to identify them. And this has allowed us to identify 12 species in Australia. And we know more broadly there's about 30 different shark species responsible for depredation globally. So it's by no means sort of one rogue shark species that's doing this. Um, both methods are obviously very useful. And the great thing is they're both um, amenable to citizen science. So recreational fishers have been helping a lot with collecting this data. And then on to the next theme of the review, which was managing depredation. As I said a number of times already, it's a complex issue, and we need to start having a discussion around our goals and expectations. In some areas where depredation is high, no matter what mitigation measure we use, it's probably unlikely that we're ever going to be able to eliminate it altogether. So we really need to identify a sort of level of depredation which we deem to be tolerable, um, kind of like a tax, I guess, if you think about it. And then willingness to pay is, depending on which strategies we use to mitigate depredation, they all have costs associated with them. So what is our sort of baseline willingness that we're going to pay for these things? And then education is a key part of the mix. So obviously, we've done a fair bit of science now on this issue. And communicating it is an important part of that. Um, this involves working closely with recreational fishing peak body groups. Uh, and there was some great uh, information put out by Wreckfish West. So it's in the bottom left corner there, there's an online article they put out where they did like an interview with a tackle shop owner where he sort of described some of the tips that you can use to reduce depredation. And that's actually a really nice way of getting the information out there because generally recreational fishers are more likely to be trusting and listen to 
that sort of a voice rather than a scientist. So there's, we need to sort of bring together these new ways of communicating the science. Um, and also peer-to-peer -peer communication between fishers. So in some of the work we did in Western Australia, it was really interesting talking to the local communities in those areas because they've adapted their sort of fishing techniques really well to try and mitigate depredation. But then you get other sort of fishers coming in from other areas that are pretty naive. And then, so if you can start up those conversations between the local fishers and the visitors, then you can really help this sort of dissemination of information. And on the right here is just an example from some work we've been doing at Lord Howe Island, which is off the east coast of Australia. It's a tiny island. And it's a very small community there, and they sort of, fishing is a really important part of their identity. So we've been doing some work with them to look at factors that they've already been using to reduce depredation and some other factors based on science that we can use. So some examples of those are they've actually started rotating their fishing areas, almost a bit like crop rotation in agriculture, where they'll fish a certain site for a given amount of time and then give it some months to recover so that, there's, so that you not keep going back to that spot and sort of training the sharks in that area to associate boats with food. Moving location frequently, so just sort of stopping there fishing for half an hour, getting the first few fish and then moving on is something that a lot of people are already using, not just here but in other places. Uh, interestingly, we got some good data from some tagging work that we've been doing on the, on the main shark species responsible for depredation. We found that they had quite a distinct depth range from about 30 to 100 meters. So the fishers are now fishing either shallower than 30 meters or deeper than 100 meters to avoid that depth range of the sharks and that's bringing some benefits. Another big thing is bringing fish waste back to land. So some people have started using fish waste as compost rather than just dumping it in the sea because this really is sort of having a, an effect on training sharks to associate boats with food. And then also some factors like using electric reels instead of rods and diversifying target species. Shark population management, as Gary touched on, Many people are suggesting that we could use um, either commercial fishing for sharks or culling as a way to reduce populations. This assumes that there's this sort of clear linear relationship between population and depredation. And obviously, you've got behavioral changes in, of sharks in the mix there as well. Uh, there's many different complexities to this. Obviously, shark fishing is generally very unselective, so you're likely to catch species which may be the ones depredating, but you're also going to catch species that might be protected or managed already. Um, if you're doing it as a commercial fishery, the marketability of shark products is also limited for larger sharks, so you've got things like PCBs and mercury in the flesh. And then, interestingly, there's other um, human-wildlife conflicts where they've tried things like culling in the past, and, and there's sort of learnings we can get from those. Technical solutions, Gary's already talked about at length, so essentially deterrents are likely to be one part of the solution, but they're not going to be a silver bullet. We need to test these devices to make sure they're actually claiming to do what they say they do. And even then, we don't really understand yet whether there's going to be any habituation of the sharks to these devices, and they're not going to likely be uh, useful for all types of fishing. For example, the bonefish fishing on the flats, we're using very light gear, you're not going to be able to chuck one of these devices on your line. Um, and things like commercial net fisheries as well, it's not all just about line fishing. So. so overall, in summary, the review found that shark depredation is something that's happening all around the world. Uh, it's a big issue affecting recreational fishers, there's many different shark species involved. And there's a whole lot of different drivers affecting it, so shark behavior, shark abundance, changes in fishing practices. In many places, we don't even have any baseline data on it yet, which we're working to try and address. Um, but in Australia and the US, at least, where we've made some great advances in the last sort of eight to 10 years, we understand the issue a lot more, and now we're working on mitigation. And yeah, the mitigation space is going to involve a whole suite of technologies, um, fisher education, adapting fishing strategies, and really trying to improve relationships between fishers and scientists and fishery managers to set some coherent goals. So I'd just like to acknowledge again all my co-authors and all the rec fishers and other stakeholders who helped out with our depredation research. <laughs> So 
So last up, we've got what was another talk by Grace Castleberry. Um, yeah. Someone else is stepping in for Grace today. And this talk is going to be more focused on the overlap between predator and prey. So, Thanks. Is that clicker here? Or oh, this is sorry. the mouse? It's the, uh, that one, the, this the greens to move forward. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a pointer here? There's no pointer. Ah, OK. You can use the mouse as a pointer. Ah, that's OK. All right, as everyone uh, change the section here. Uh, OK, so I'm Luke Griffin. Uh, Grace Castleberry is a colleague of mine. Uh, and today we'll be talking about a really interesting study, uh, part of our dissertation about deep predation and spatial overlap between Atlantic tarpon and great hammerhead sharks. Uh, so we just concluded a survey, around 1,000 participants uh, focused on tarpon fishing responded. Uh, and on average, depending on if you're a fly angler or a spin angler, uh, on the low end, on average, you're losing about one fish per season. At the high end, you're losing uh, seven tarpon per season to depredation or post-release mortality. And that estimate's pretty high, uh, considering we have thousands of anglers uh, in this fishery, and they're catching thousands of fish every year. So I won't define depredation now, but there's a big concern with tarpon particularly because they're long-lived. You know, that fish might be 50, 60 years old. Um, they're late maturing, up where uh, it takes like 12 years to reach maturity. And unique to this fishery, uh, these fish are migrating thousands of kilometers into these pre-spawning aggregation sites, and they're big schools of 1,000-plus fish. And obviously, it attracts a bunch of anglers because it's much easier to catch these fish in these pre-spawning aggregations. And then they move offshore to spawn. So before they move offshore to spawn, these sharks are essentially hanging out around these areas. Um, and depredation events are quite elevated here. Um, so this, we're going to talk about a case study here. Um, this is a catch and release fishery, uh, primarily. Uh, so this is a huge source of mortality um, uh, that's unquantified. Of course, we know sharks can change their foraging behavior um, surrounding anglers. Uh, and then Andy gave that talk about Grace's uh, survey. Uh, there's a growing conflict here. Uh, especially in the last five or so years. Um, yeah, what do I want to say about that one? Oh, when we're actually fishing, you'll see these hammerheads, and they're all scarred up on their cephalofoil, their dorsal is all torn up, and it's almost this retribution action. They're protected, but still, when you lose a big fish like that, not everyone's smiling, and they actually throw their boat into reverse, and they'll just hit the uh, hammerhead directly in the face or the dorsal. And so it's not uncommon to see a lot of these hammerheads all torn up. Uh, this uh, study we released in last year, uh, we wanted to understand on a broader scale, uh, what is the overlap between tarpon and hammerheads? So right now, we're just focusing on the Florida Keys, just uh, at the point of Florida. Uh, this is a substantial mixing area for tarpon. They aggregate here before they move offshore to spawn. Uh, tomorrow, I'll be giving a talk a bit more details about the migratory patterns of these fish. But what you need to take away here is there's very particular spaces and locations that these overlap events happen. And we looked at, is it non-random events happening? Are these sharks arriving to different places when there's tarpon present or not present there? And so that big circle, this is a really popular pre-spawning aggregation site. There's a lot of anglers here targeting tarpon. We found that hammerheads were actively showing up here right when the tarpon were um, arriving. So we're going to drill into this location. It's called Bahia Honda. Every dot here is an acoustic receiver array that played into that last study. And then in the top right, this zoomed in, we have two bridges. The uh, non-operational bridge is on the south side, which will become relevant in a few slides. But you can see all these bridges, or bridges, all these boats lined up in the bridge pilings. So every day of the fishing season that lasts about three months, uh, there'll be a boat in every one of these spans. And they're just directly fishing for tarpon. They have crabs on the bottom. They're drifting these crabs. They're quite productive in fishing. And this is our good friend, one of our guides that's concerned about this issue. He works with us. Uh, you can see he has a client up front. Uh, there's a big hammerhead. It's circling the boat. It, the depredations typically happen right next to the boat. So there's two components uh, of Grace's dissertation work in, involving this chapter. Uh, so there's one, there's predator-prey dynamics. So we're going to be looking at spatial ecology. And then the human-wildlife conflict. How can we mitigate this, uh, this potential issue? So she sat on that defunct, that non-operational bridge. 
uh, and she ran a visual survey. She literally had just binoculars counting how many depredations occur. And then we're going to disentangle the uh, factors that might be the most influential on depredations. So there's acoustic telemetry as well that I hinted at, and we're going to be looking at that space overlap um, with tarpon and hammerheads. So we tagged around 200 tarpon. Uh, I would have chosen a bigger fish uh, in that photo, but uh, that's a small, rough, like, sub-adult fish. And then again, on the lower left, we have hammerheads we tagged. So we tagged around 200 tarpon, uh, around 30 were frequently using the bridge area. We tagged 17 hammerheads. Uh, that's also a smaller size hammerhead. A lot of times these are females. We, had, um, we checked the, if they were pregnant or not. Uh, and then we also put these cattle tags on, uh, the, the great hammerheads. And so the guides were working with us. They would report if that same shark was reoccurring, that depredation event. So just to, some descriptive stats here on the visual survey. So that's the bridge that Grace sat on in the heat uh, from Mar or April through May. Uh, 211 hours of fishing that's just sitting on that bridge for eight days straight. Nearly 400 hooked fish. It's very hard to land a tarpon. Uh, nearly 100 were landed, 25 depredations were observed, and then we also had four post-release mortalities. These are very hard to capture. It's probably happening at a much uh, higher rate here. Um, and what was interesting here, the majority of the, the hammerheads that we saw uh, did not have those cattle tags. So we suspect a very large group of hammerheads here. Uh, again, uh, this might be a potential uh, reproductive relationship here because we did see that some were pregnant. Uh, it takes about 12 minutes to land a tarpon on average, and the depredations were actually happening um, in a less amount of time, at around nine and a half minutes. Uh, so we think the hammerheads are sort of hovering right by the boats and they get onto the tarpon fairly quickly. And then nine minutes to post release, again, that's a difficult metric to measure. We're going to be exploring that in the future work we do, uh, but it can be quite delayed. And if you exclude all those um, uh, fight times that were happened uh, less than five minutes, because a lot of these tarpon get hung up in the bridge pilings, um, so we reduce all those events that, you know, you break off a fish uh, that happened less than five minutes, we have about a 15% uh, mortality rate uh, related to depredations. And again, this is just what we can observe from the bridge, so it's, it's much likely much higher. So looking at that visual survey data, what are the factors that are influencing depredation? Uh, this is a decision tree, uh, so I'll, I'll walk you briefly through it. I won't go into every uh, branch here, but we're gonna start at number one, fight time. Is it greater than 12 minutes, you go to the right. If it's less than 12 minutes, you go to the left. Uh, and then you go to the current. Is it coming in or is it going out? So we're just gonna be focusing on this branch here. So the fight times are less than 12 minutes, the current is going out, uh, and that's going to be actually the, the biggest drivers, uh, the correlations uh, with depredation events. So the dark gray bars here are those mortality events, and the white gray uh, are survival rates. So those are the two biggest factors that we saw, less than 12 minutes and the current's actually going out. And that, that matches well with what we know about the fishing when we're tagging there ourselves when we encounter sharks and also working with the fishing guides. So let's zoom in on the spatial ecology. Uh, these are acoustic receivers. We lined them up in a really clustered uh, group here, and that's where we're going to look at these fine-scale movements between these two species. So uh, we have mean residence time on the y-axis in minutes and month on the x-axis, and the spawning period for tarpon is, mar well, they show up in March, uh, really happens April, May, and June, at least in the Keys. Uh, and you can see the hammerhead uh, residence increases right around the uh, spawning period of tarpon. Uh, the data I'll show tomorrow, the tarpon dramatically leave in uh, early June, especially July, and it seems like the hammerhead presence decreases as well around the bridge. If we break that down into uh, night, day, and night, so hours is on the x-axis here. Again, uh, tarpon is relatively uh, stable. This is a pre-spawning aggregation. But interestingly, hammerheads increase during the day and then decrease at night. And so that matches well with the uh, angling pressure, right? Most of the angling pressure is happening during the day. So we're going to look at the actual movements here. Again, we have those black dots. Those are the acoustic receivers. Uh, so we have yellow being the tarpon, red being the hammerhead. Uh, and so these are sort of boiled down home ranges, the core use areas 
the most used areas by these species are represented here. These are our 50% contours. So you can see the uh, spawning season, we'll just take the month of April. Uh, the tarpon, it's, it's quite wrapped around that new bridge. That's where most of the fishing action happens. Uh, and then you can directly see the hammerheads pretty much matching exactly where the space use of that tarpon. And in the non-spawning period, there's a lot of sub-adults that uh, hang out around here in November. Uh, it's a bit more of a broader distribution of those two space uses by hammerheads and tarpon. Uh, this one was really interesting. Uh, this is that incoming outgoing uh, current that was talking about. It absolutely rips here. Um, and, and most people think that the outgoing current is the best for fishing tarpon here. This is when the crabs, the, the mullet are flushing out of the, the, the bay. Um, so on incoming, you can see the tarpon are generally staying in the same place. Hammerheads are both in the front or behind the bridge. Uh, and then the outgoing, so you hook up with the tarpon at that new bridge, that north bridge, the top bridge there, and then you kind of drift with the current. And the hammerhead space use is concentrated and smaller right there at that new bridge. So it's pretty obvious that these hammerheads are almost waiting for these uh, interactions and these events. So just to uh, do grace justice here, I'll top, um, talk about the conclusions. Uh, so we, we believe that hammerheads uh, are modifying their space use at this uh, pre-spawning location, Bay of Honda, in response to tarpon presence. And I should remind you, this is not the only pre-spawning location uh, for tarpon. This is across the Florida state uh, boundary. Uh, this is just one very popular location. Uh, daytime presence overlaps with angling pressure. So again, when anglers are catching more tarpon, hammerheads are showing up in uh, higher residence periods. And then deep predation is frequent, right? That's that 15% minimum rate. Uh, but right now, tarpon lack a stock assessment. The next phase is understanding that population level impact. So we explored that a little bit with the survey. We'll do another survey. Uh, but it, we also want to understand the aggregation size uh, and how many fish from those aggregations are being lost every year. And we're lacking subsurface post-release mortality. There's a lot of cryptic mortality in a lot of fisheries. Uh, so we're not just dealing with deep predation here. Um, and then the biggest and best advice is we need to land tarpon faster, right? So we can look at policy and management. Andy talked about one of our other studies about permit, and we actually saw a 90% depredation rate. We had to force a closure. It's the best thing for that fishery. It's very concerning. Um, but here, time area closure, it could be very controversial. This is a culturally and economic important species uh, across Florida. Uh, it's slow, it's, uh, and it, it should be last, thought of as last resort, right? We have other options to explore for, for and that could be behavior-based. So obviously heavier tackle would be very useful here, um, and education is going to be critical. So we can talk about awareness on the outgoing, maybe explore night fishing. There's problems with that, with that current as well. Uh, but we need to up, up the education and awareness, and it's becoming more culturally um, appropriate, I guess, in the angling community to shift your space use when there's a lot of sharks present. So it, it's great that the uh, guides here are working with us um, because they know we want to sort of take a behavior-based approach first. And also we'll explore the technology as well as you guys heard about that in the last couple uh, talks. So with that, uh, Grace has lots of great, wonderful acknowledgments here. I encourage you to reach out to her. We can definitely answer some questions. Um, and I'd love to, yeah, hop up on the panel here. Thank you. Thanks, Lucas. And yeah, thanks to Grace again. Uh, Gary and Andy, if you'd like to step up, feel free to ask us a few questions. Do we have some questions? Hello, uh, gentlemen. Uh, my name is Cliff Hutt. I'm actually with NOAA Fisheries, Atlantic HMS. So I'm one of those policymakers who's going to have to deal with these issues. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, thanks. <laughs> We're hearing a lot about it. 
Uh, and I've actually been engaged with Marcus and some of the other researchers and collaborating on the work they're doing. Um, on one of the earlier talks, you uh, stated that we're lacking a lot of data on this, which is true, because we're really not collecting any data on it in any of our key recreational fisheries collections. But we're looking to change that soon. But the big pushback we get from them is they don't want us adding a whole bunch of questions and slowing down their efficiency, you know, because what they need to do is interview as many anglers as they can when they're out there doing dockside surveys. So my question to you all, if you had the opportunity to add some questions to a, you know, wide-based national survey that's collecting angler information, to collect some data on shark depredation to get at kind of the spatial and temporal nature of this phenomenon, and you were limited to say two or three questions, what would you add to that survey? Yeah, thanks for the question, great question. It is one of the key things that came out of that workshop we had in Australia in terms of information um, missing. And uh, the guys that have been working on this issue First thing we said was we need some sort of, uh, you know, uh, better reporting across recreational commercial sectors, and because um, I'm I'm pretty sure this is a, a very patchy issue, uh, and getting that kind of those patterns in the data. So it's not across the board. Some people leave you leave you to believe that it's happening everywhere all the time, which isn't the case. And I think that presentation on tarpons kind of making my point. There's an, there's an aggregation of fishes and hammerheads and tarpon all happening at the same time. If you can tease that out, you can get into that education space, which is, is the way out of this, seriously is. Um, but without the information, you don't give people good directions. So that'll be my starting point. The exact three questions, we can talk about that afterwards. Yeah, that's a really important thing, and that's something we've been grappling with in, in Queensland as well in terms of, yeah, not wanting to increase survey fatigue. Um, so I think the quantitative aspect is, for me, the most important. So just getting an idea of where the depredation occurred and how many fish they lost. Also, in some places, whether they actually saw the depredation event happen because it, you know, it could be another predator, it might not be a shark necessarily. Um, I mean, I guess regardless of the predator, it's still depredation, so that's, from a mortality perspective, less important. Um, and then also, potentially, if they were targeting a specific species as well, or whether they, you know, they're just fishing for sort of a mixed range of species. So that would probably be, yeah, I guess, the three ones I'd recommend. But. I might just have another quick comment there. So one of the things I wanted to ask about Grace's work, and she can't answer it, is I'm really interested in that fishery, the tarpon fishery. If you'd been there in the 1940s and 50s where tarpon were coming together in those places of spawn, what would have been the kind of baseline level of depredation? Because it's, it's, it's got to be that increased fishing activity, right? Which is the thing you can't get away from. And so, but we don't have those baseline data in this context, and that's, that's very much an issue. And you can't make it up either. Um, you could talk some of the old timers, I guess, and kind of use that. But uh, it's, it's the increasing activity in fishing uh, at certain places, which is, which is kind of not helping the situation. And that's where the education comes in. Um, yeah, so was, I think the first depredation for tarpon was in the 1920s, and it's not uncommon to actually see a great hammerhead chase down a hammerhead uh, tarpon up along the banks and feed on it naturally. And so I think the semi-structured interviews are going to be really critical because we have lots of old-timing guides in the Keys and around Florida specifically uh, just to ask those questions, yeah, and get a historical baseline the best we can. Uh, not about depredation, yeah. yeah. Another one as well is, I guess, spatial questions as well. Um, obviously, you know, wreck fishers are sometimes wary of giving away specifics of where they were fishing. Uh, but some of the interesting things we found doing those surveys in Western Australia was that there was, we did some work looking at which factors are actually influencing where people choose to fish. And actually, um, Travel distance was a really important one. So we found there was a particular reef a certain distance away from the main boat ramp where a lot of people were going. And that was actually the area that had the highest depredation as well. So I think there's something occurring where you know these areas get fished again and again, and that's leading to the sharks really associating boats with this source of food in that area. So I think having some aspect 
some idea of the spatial aspect of the fishing helps as well. Yeah. Um, I'm Kim Anderson. I'm a charter boat operator from up in Cairns, recreational angler. Um, I fished the Bay Honda Bridge back in the late 90s. I was lucky enough to, uh, to land all my tarpon there. We didn't have any shark interaction in, in, in the time period when I was there. Um, we have a similar issue with the black marlin fishery up off Cairns where in the last decade there, you've got the double whammy of, uh, of uh, increase in shark population and you've got the uh, learnt behaviour aspect of it as well. So we obviously take some measures in place to land heavier tackle, land fish quickly, but it's still a major issue. Um, I just, uh, to what point is, it's, uh, from the way I look at it, I would like a bit of a comment that, uh, you know, shark conservation measures seem to be the cause of it from, from, from what I've seen out on the ocean. Um, and I, it's wonderful you guys are doing work on depredation, but the overarching uh, thing, particularly in Queensland, where you've got size restrictions and whatever else, I think, you know, to what extent are conservation measures forcing the issue? Yeah, so it definitely should be thought of as a conservation success story, right? Even up in Massachusetts and the Northeast, we have much more great whites, and there's a lot of issues, but it's a conservation success story. Um, yeah. Yeah, so in that review paper that John's talk was on, we spent a lot of time talking about this um, sort of baseline information on where shark stocks are and, and recoveries and the, the attitudes in society about towards sharks. It's, it's quite different now. And I think uh, the problem is we've seen an increase, and I'll sort of focus on recreational fishing, we've seen an increase in uh, kind of people's leisure time and expectations and what they want to get out of their kind of limited amount of time when they're doing that kind of stuff. And so when it coincides with, you know, shark populations possibly, well, hopefully increasing because they've, they've been protected for a good reason, um, for, for those sectors that have been impacted, that's just not acceptable. But I'll keep coming back to somebody that works in government. If there's an issue and I get called in my minister's office, he's going to want certain kind of facts presented to him before he kind of moves forward. Because whether we like it or not, and I'm a fisherman myself, keen for recreational fishermen, politicians make decisions based on all the people in society. And a lot of people are urbanised. I think somebody talked to that uh, earlier and becoming more and more so. And uh, it's the people that go out there and do their fishing that are kind of complain about things. But we're a kind of, we're a kind of small party of part of that. And that's, that's the problem. Politicians have got to make difficult situations in difficult situations, you know, in it's complex issues. So it's not going to go away soon. I genuinely believe through the work I've been doing and the conversation with people who are grappling with the same thing around the world, education is the way out of this. It's, it's just really got to be. And, and operational ways of kind of minimising it to a point, but that's you'll never minimise it to zero, and the sharks aren't going to go anywhere. Yeah, and just to go off that, angler culture is changing dramatically fast, at least in the Florida Keys with the flats fishery folks, uh, especially within the fly fishing group. Uh, before you'd hold a fish, you'd grip and grin. Uh, there wasn't much concern for the fish. Uh, now, specific to tarpon, there's many guides that will only jump the fish and then they break it off. So they actually use very light tackle and they barb the, they do barbless hooks and they just break it off. And so that transition took maybe 10 years or so. And so now it's slowly moving into the spin category, which is the more uh, risky category for depredations. Yeah. yeah, and I think coming back to the shark conservation thing, I think it's really important that we have the information that we put out there is relevant at like a local scale to people as well as sort of more of a national or global scale, because particularly in Australia, we have pretty healthy shark populations compared to other places around the world. And I think when, you know, when fishers see these new papers coming out saying, you know, all these sharks are declining, which, yeah, on a global scale is, seems to be true, but I think something that they relate to what they see in their backyard is maybe quite different. So I think we need to have conversations and be cognizant of the different scales of these things and, and work on our communication strategies. And I think as well, um, yeah, coming back to the complexities of shark population management, I guess there's some people s suggesting it could be done as a commercial fishery or some suggesting culling. Um, the marine environment's obviously much more complex than, say, for example, culling kangaroos or some, one of those contexts. And for some of those species, we need some more baseline data to understand, because we're talking about, you know, 12 different shark species responsible. Some of those have stock assessments. 
Some of them we know very little about at all. So trying to actually understand, you know, what, how many sharks would we need to take out to actually have a benefit. And then you've got questions around, if you took out all the sharks in a given area, would that area then just be repopulated by other sharks coming in from somewhere else? Which is something they found with culling of wolves in North America. Um, but the good thing is we can really learn a lot from these other studies of human wildlife conflict, which are much more sort of advanced in their understanding than we are of shark depredation. I think um, overlapping, I guess, with a couple of the questions, um, the idea of, of spatial distribution and looking at um, where it's occurring, what species are um, being implicated for the depredation, you know, reflecting on you know what's happening in the Northeast in the United States with um, not only are white sharks coming back, but the seal population is coming back, and there's a lot of animosity, not just to white sharks, but seals. Um, and then you, you going back to Gary's point about the greater population, a lot of people in the general population just love seeing the seals come back, right? And so um, it's it's a I think it's a, a, a beyond the complex in terms of um, the general public and not just within the recreational angling community. And I think that, um, you know, I think that's where understanding the distribution of the, the species that are being lost, working with the recreational angling community, working with the broader community as well. So we are, you know, we're talking about sharks, you know, apex predator in the marine environment, depredation, but there's a parallel conversation going on with the water users and the surfers in particular are, are equally, they, they, they think similarly in, in part, in some places, to the way the fishermen do, that just get rid of the shark problem because it's inconvenient, it, I'm, you know, I want to carry on surfing. And governments have to kind of tread carefully in that way to, um, you know, kind of, kind of tell those guys that. But they're equally not happy that government isn't just going to that simple route and getting rid of the sharks. And the same arguments that we're, arguments, lines of evidence we're putting forward would apply in that situation, but it doesn't keep everybody happy by any means. All right, we might just wrap it up with one last question because there's some great conversation going on here, but everyone's waiting for us, I think. Yeah, guys, a really great session and um, I learned quite a lot. Uh, just relation to... Uh, these anecdotes of the increasing shark numbers, it just seems to be some hesitancy amongst some of the scientists in that area to accept that uh, their, their conservation efforts have actually probably been effective. It's one thing that I've, uh, I've seen and, and eventually I think the, the fishing community will be the first people to tell them that and this is part of that process. But one other thing just with the sharks being able to follow boats around, it's something that I've thought about having interactions with sharks in places I never used to, is uh, my boat nowadays has this modern sounder on it with this uh, giving out this acoustic sonar signal that uh, must make it easier for them to follow us around compared to the uh, ones we used to use. And is that something that uh, also you guys should consider? Because it looks like an acoustic uh, deterrent has some effect in reducing it, so the acoustic signature of the modern fishing boat may have some con contribution to the problem. Yeah, I think that's, that's very true. There's a lot of evidence of that. Uh, John pointed you direction to the article that was on the Wreckfish West website, which was uh, the experts talking about how you can minimise depredation, and I'm pretty sure that was one of the 10 aspects that the, the guy talked to, and a lot of, lot of people up in the northwestern and western Australia who basically live up there rather than visiting fishers who kind of kind of have worked ways around this to some degree. And turning off your motors and your sound as, as you're approaching your fishing ground is, is one thing they, they definitely play on. And the introduction of use of electric motors, um, no sounders. So there's another little kind of, it's not gonna solve the problem completely, but it's another little kind of part of minimizing that depredation to the point that your, your enjoyment or your livelihoods kind of uh, impacted to the less it can be without the solution of no sharks in that particular location. So. It's very much a thing. I think it's something we could, you know, certainly do some work on to, you know, quantify a bit and, you know, t test different things to get that advice a bit more sharpened. But it, it's it's out there and it's being used by the people in the know already. So. Yeah, and another thing as well, um, in terms of the Spanish mackerel fishery, there's uh, certain areas where they fish with smaller dories, which some of which have, you know, very tiny engines or even electric engines, and they give off much 
you know, much weaker sound than a bigger vessel would, and I think that really helps. Some of the fishers are actually saying that's one of the key things they're thinking about in terms of why they get less depredation from those smaller dories compared to, you know, larger vessels with bigger outboards. Um, and yeah, I think the sharks are responding to a whole range of sensory cues when they're doing this behavior. There's even been some work in the past that shows like the low frequency vibrations and sounds from a struggling fish is enough to attract them. And things like the, the sound that a spear gun makes when it goes off is enough to attract them. A lot of spearfishers sort of say that anecdotally, so yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. All right, let's let's call it an afternoon. Well done. Thanks, Thanks everyone.